Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what every investor needs to know to kick off the new year right. Presenting today are Dan Russo, Chief Market Strategist at Chaken Analytics, and Nick Webb, Executive Vice President at Chaken Analytics. Chaken Analytics is not registered as a broker dealer or investment advisor with either the US Securities and Exchange Commission or with any state securities regulatory authority. Chicken Analytics is for educational purposes only and is not a trade advisory service. Past results of any trading system or methodology do not guarantee future results. Be sure to submit your questions through the, for the webinar using the Zoom Q&A window, which you can access in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. I'll be available to respond to your questions. This webinar is being recorded and a replay will be sent out to all registrants tomorrow. To get us started, here is Dan Russo. All right, hey Josh, thanks. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, second trading day of the year and all for already off to an, to an interesting start thanks to Apple and we're gonna dive into that uh, in just a moment. But yeah, we just wanted to kick things off the, for the year talking about what every investor needs to know to get going here to start the new year, right? So before we do that, just a little bit of background about myself. It's actually funny, I was just thinking about this and I changed. I had to change the number. Been on the street for 19 years. I actually started um, this week, uh, the, the week after, after New Year uh, in 2000 and on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And what's interesting about that, and in particular, given the environment now, is I was essentially born into my career uh, right in front of a bear market, right? If anybody who recalls 2000. Uh, March of 2000 was the top and the popping of the tech bubble. That is when I started my career on Wall Street. Uh, I am a former New York Stock Exchange market maker, so I started uh, as a trading assistant and worked my way up to become a market maker on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm also a chartered market technician, so what does that mean? That means um, I went through a rigorous uh, three-part exam over the course of two years to earn the designation uh, of chartered market technician. Uh, and with that was actually asked to be the chairman of the New York chapter of the Chartered Market Technicians Association. And as you can imagine, the New York chapter is the largest chapter in the world. So that was a, a great honor for me, uh, number one. And number two, it's really great because it puts me in contact with a lot of really smart people who I discuss markets with uh, on a daily basis which is a good jumping off point because prior to joining Cheek and Analytics, I spent 10 years on a sales and trading desk covering large institutional investors. So think about uh, what you would expect when you hear institutional investors, large mutual funds, uh, hedge funds, as well as pension funds all over the country. And I am also a frequent guest on Bloomberg TV. And it's funny, uh, just a couple of hours ago, the producer for uh, one of their shows actually reached out to kind of book me for a couple of spots. So I will be on uh, one day in January and one day in February as well. Um, so here's a picture of me in action uh, on the set of Bloomberg, but I'm gonna kick it over to Nick now. He can give you a little bit of his background. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for uh, joining the session and thanks Dan, it's an honor to co-chair a uh, meeting with you. So I've been 30 years in the financial services, the last two with Chaken Analytics. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Thomson Reuters and I was working with some of the largest institutional buy side firms as well as the research departments on the sell side. So I've been very clued into this part of the market, very much so. Uh, and when I was working with them, uh, we were working on pulling together better investment techniques, uh, making sure that they were using the correct information when they were doing their research. Uh, so it's been uh, hand in glove with them. Uh, and prior to that, I was an economist with a uh, economic research firm. And so over the years, I've worked with some of the smartest institutional investors. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, got down and dirty with them in terms of what they were working on. And I have brought that over to Chaken Analytics and have enjoyed working here for the last couple of years. So Dan, why don't I turn it back over to you on this sort of quiet, uneventful day in the market? Yeah, uh, quiet and, and uneventful. So considering uh, how quiet and uneventful <laughs> it's been for the past, call it twelve months, I figured we would start things off with a with a poll question uh, for everybody who's in the audience. What is your view on stocks as two thousand nineteen begins? And 
Josh has put the, uh, the choices up there. Are you bullish? Are you bearish? Or are you cautious as the year begins? We'll give everybody a, f a few seconds to, to answer that and post the results. I'll give it just a few more seconds here and then we'll share this with everybody. Yeah, that's great. All right, here we go. Ah, so 54% cautious, 32% bearish, only 14% bullish. And I guess that makes a lot of sense because in 2018, we had two corrections for the S&P 500 and small caps have entered a bear market and kind of contrast that with the steady rise that we saw in 2017. I think the volatility uh, does make people adopt a more cautious stance. And what's interesting to me, those of you who are cautious and those of you who are bearish really are kind of in line with the market. And I, I tend to agree with that view. Uh, here's the SPY, our proxy for the S&P 500, the largest ETF out there for trading the S&P 500 or for gaining exposure to the quote unquote market. And you can see uh, that the move has kind of broken through key support from the February lows. And, you know, this was the, the Christmas Eve sell off and then subsequent rally. And we, you know, kind of tried to test this breakdown level. Uh, and then faded today with that with that uh, negative pre-announcement from Apple. And what's interesting to me is that our institutional investors, my former clients, uh, we can measure what where what what they're doing via one of our indicators, the Chicken Money Flow indicator. And we can see really throughout the fall and into the winter here and into the new year, institutional investors have been sellers of stocks. So those of you who are bearish or who are cautious. Uh, are kind of in line with what we're seeing in the marketplace. And the IWM, here's the, uh, the small cap stocks. They have been underperforming since the fall. And you know we take a very top-down thematic approach to, to the market. And some, I write a note every day, and it's something that you will receive when you become a Chaken Analytics member. You'll see how I think thematically. And one of the themes that we've been talking about really since the end of the summer has been the underperformance of small cap stocks and how that's a signal uh, for risk off within the marketplace. So if we look at the IWM, uh, our proxy for the Russell 2000, you can see a similar dynamic. It has broken down. Notice that the rally didn't even come close to retesting the break, uh, the breakdown level. And if we look down here, we can see relative strength against the S&P 500. Clearly, uh, an underperformer since the late summer and early and early fall. So, you know, yeah. it makes sense to be cautious in that environment. Was there a question? No, Dan. I was just going to point out in December uh, there was a hundred billion dollars pulled out of the markets uh, when you track fund flows. So that absolutely dovetails with what you're showing from the money flow aspect. Investors were just pulling money out at a almost unprecedented clip. Yep. I, no, that's true. I, obviously, we pay a lot of attention to that. I pay a lot of attention as a, as a strategist to money flows and what other investors are doing and how they're positioning. But what we're going to walk through today is, you know, kind of how you can utilize the tools in Shaken Analytics to have gotten you in front of that. Uh, and and we're going to kind of, but first, before we get there, let's let's put pullbacks and, and corrections and bear markets into perspective. Um, this is data going back to 1945, and it's a little bit dated right now. We need to uh, uh, get an updated version. But what I would say is, what we're what we're what we're looking at now is, you know, a correction or a potentially a bear market. Now, technically, uh, on a closing basis, the S and P 500 has not closed down. 20% from a closing low. So the S&P 500 is technically not in a bear market, but it certainly does feel like we are in one. Uh, but what should jump out at everybody is that these are perfectly normal. And in a 78-year time frame, you know, we've had 27 corrections of between 10 and 20%. Uh, and if you add the two from last year, we're up to 29. And we've had eight bear markets or declines of... 20 to 40%. And to me, 
you know, we're kind of right on schedule for one. If you consider kind of 27 of these within the past 78 years, that's roughly one every three years or so. The last time we saw something like this was late 2015, early 2016. So the point is these are normal cycles for the market. Uh, they don't feel normal when you're going through them, but they are perfectly normal. And what they allow is they allow us as equity investors to achieve better than risk-free rates of return. So now that we know we're kind of living through this, let's look at what the average looks like by keeping in mind that we're not exactly going to be guaranteed the average, but the average length of de the decline is about four months and we're currently three months into this decline if it is going to just kind of stay in fact as a correction. And then the average time to recovery is three months from the bottom. Uh, if we do go into a bear market, the average uh, length of the decline is about 11 months, and then it takes another 14 months to, to round our way out. So this is kind of the framework for the marketplace right now. And I just want to you know, just remind everybody again, it's perfectly normal, and it's what allows us to get better than risk-free returns. But as you're living through it, as our poll showed, everybody's bearish or cautious. Fear has gripped the stock market. This is the CNN fear and greed index. It can be a contrary indicator at times, and but we've been living in a zone of extreme fear for the past few weeks. This reading is as of uh, last night after the market closed. The reading is 12 um, a week prior, it was at four. So, but we've been kind of living in this zone of extreme fear for a while. So, the rest of the marketplace, um, the rest of the marketplace is, is with the majority of respondents to uh, to the poll question. So, uh, I'd say that we're kind of living through it. It's perfectly normal, and we're going to show you how you can utilize our tools to actually take advantage of what's going on, whether we're in a bull market, a bear market, a correction, what have you, uh, we have the tools that can help you prosper in that environment. What's interesting though is panic does create new lows and we're certainly seeing, at least around the time of Christmas Eve, what felt like a panic. If you notice new lows for the S&P 500 uh, at, at the Christmas Eve sell-off were double, double, what we saw at the lows in 2008, 2009, which was the beginning of a global financial crisis. So, you know, the panic sell off that we're seeing is more extreme than what we saw back in 08 and 09. But we can kick it back over to Nick because there could be opportunities there because the fundamental picture is actually not as bad as what the market will have you believe. That's right, Dan. Uh, there was a period of time earlier this year where there was a market PE that was sitting up around almost 18 and a half uh, forward earnings. That's very high and that signals that the, the, either you're gonna get extremely fast growth in earnings to compensate for that or frankly the prices have to come down. You can see the green dotted line there, that's the five year average of the forward PE and the blue line, blue dotted line, is actually the 10 year. And what's happened with this sell off is that the market has become better in balance. And you can see over the years, it, it's become a good jumping off place. This sort of 14 PE is actually where people start looking around for values in the marketplace because, hey, you know, the market is not so extremely val valued anymore. And I think we're sort of we need to get through the panic stage of the market. But once the panic is over, I think people are going to look around and they're going to see really good opportunities in the marketplace. Yeah, I think, Nick, that's an interesting point. And, you know, as you can imagine, I still keep in contact with a lot of my former clients, you know, hedge fund, hedge fund managers and mutual fund managers and analysts. And some, you know, I covered all different styles, growth managers, special situations managers, and value managers. And as that PE has come in, some of my buddies who are more value oriented have started hitting me. Hey, what is, what is the, the chicken <laughs> model say about this name or that name guy, the value managers are starting to wake up. 
Yeah, and that's a good sign. That is a really good sign because it does mean that they're waiting for the right opportunity. I think there still has to be that sort of washing out. And I can't tell you if today was the day with the whole Apple news, but there definitely was a sense that at a certain point, there are some really screaming values out there in the marketplace. Can you take to the next slide, Dan? Yeah. And what's good about the PE is that it's coming off a year where earnings were great. 2018 earnings were over 20%. Um, you can see that this is the blue lines through the last 10 years or the blue bars uh, show you how earnings have gone. There was a terrific year in 2010 where it's just off the charts, but that was coming off a very low base, uh, the 2009 recession. 2018, wasn't coming off a low base. It was actually really good earnings for companies that are out there. And also even more healthy was the revenue increase, which was, looks like it's gonna come in around 9%. That's solid. Those are solid numbers. That shows that companies out there were selling more, making more money. And, and you know, frankly, we're using that money oftentimes to repair their balance sheets. Um, and- you know What else is interesting to me about this slide too, you know, I, I'm a technician, but you know, I, I do believe that the fundamentals are important. And what jumps out to me, jumps out at me, is that earnings growth um, for the past few years has been greater than sales growth, right? For the past three years, really. So that is a sign to me of a healthy economy because that's a sign that companies are ha that, that companies have leverage and they're not forced to cut prices to drive sales, right? When you see earnings growth greater than sales growth, that is a sign of leverage for companies. And that's a sign of pricing power, if you will. And if we were in fact going into a recession, I think you'd see that start to flip. I don't know if you'd see it flip, but you'd see it get a lot closer. The other thing that drives that is companies are becoming more productive with the resources that they have. They're keeping costs in line while they're growing those revenues. And then that filters through to the bottom line earnings. And then when you turn to next year, it's not going to be as good a year as this year, but it's still a very decent year. If you look at the economy, it's still growing, uh, you know, even fighting against the Fed increases, you know, this is economy that's going to be somewhere between two and 3% next year, which is, you know, you know, that slow, steady growth is exactly what companies love. And you can see earnings growth is going to be somewhere around 8%. That may be a trifle optimistic right now, but it looks like it'll be a very solid year. So you go back to that price earnings ratio that you're looking at, and you can feel very confident that that, that value that's in the marketplace is actually well balanced with what's out there in, uh, in earnings and revenues. Um, and just... Again, a little note of caution, and I apologize for the color of the lighter bars. The lighter bars, it's, this chart's broken down by sector. So this is the S&P 500 and all the various sectors. The lighter bar bars are what the analysts were looking for in terms of what the earnings growth was going to be for calendar year 2019 back at the end of Q3. So not that long ago, three months ago, there was a little bit more optimism in the air. And you can see the darker bars are what they're forecasting now. And all perfectly normal, by the way. You know, like I said, I spent, I spent 10 years on an institutional sales and trading desk. I worked with teams of analysts. Uh, the, the analysts at the major banks tend to start out with optimistic expectations. And as time goes by, numbers always do seem to come down. So this is what we're seeing is not out of the ordinary. This is something that tends to happen basically every year, every rolling 12 month period, whatever you're looking at, numbers always come down the closer you get to the existing quarter. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know, it's not only the analyst fault, but the companies themselves actually guide the analysts lower so that they have a chance to beat the estimates when they do release earnings. And so this is exactly, uh, you know, outside of energy and a couple other sectors where the gap really is pretty wide, 
not surprising with energy, with energy prices, um, this actually is a very normal picture. But it is something that to keep your eye on because estimates have been slipping over the last quarter for the upcoming calendar year 2019. I, you know, you wouldn't want to see them go much further than this. I would agree with that. So with that being said, um, a core belief of ours at Shaken Analytics is that fundamentals drive the market, but emotions drive the market to extremes. And this is something that I believed when I was covering hedge funds and, and mutual funds. The path to profits is combining fundamentals with technicals to take your emotions out of the equations. And that's what I used to do when I was on a desk. I would combine the fundamental work of my stable of research analysts with my own technical analysis to come up with ideas and investment ideas and trading ideas, anything actionable for my clients. And it really does transition over to what I'm doing now at Chaikin Analytics. And it really resonated with me when Mark Chaikin called me completely out of the blue. I got a phone call. He introduces himself. Hi, this is, this is Mark Chaikin. And I remember, you know, as a CMT studying Mark and his indicators. And I said, well, like the money flow guy and completely embarrassed myself, stuck my foot in my mouth, right? He's like, yeah, I like the money flow guy and some other stuff too. Uh, and he started telling me about what he was doing and, and his, his view of the world. And that really just resonated with me because what I've learned is that the headlines are not your friend. Right? A lot of people are trading off the latest tweet, the latest, latest headline, what they saw on CNBC, what you saw on the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. Take a look at these two headlines from the Wall Street Journal. They're a day apart. Stocks rise. Oil rises as trade tensions ease. That was on December 3rd. And then a day later, Dow tumbles nearly 800 points as trade did, jitters return. How do you trade on that? You can't trade on that. You have to have a process. You know, especially now with the market under pressure, we are being bombarded with information. I know my inbox is, is flooded with thoughts and ideas from, from, from different forms of media. And, and this flood of information can really be an overload. And it feeds our emotions as investors and traders. And, and really, at the end of the day, our emotions within the marketplace uh, are our worst enemy. So our solution to that is Chaken Analytics platform on your desktop or on your mobile device uh, that kind of cuts through a lot of that noise. And what drives everything that we do is the Chaken power gauge. I like to think of it as your GPS for navigating the market. You can see it looks like a, a, a gauge that you would see on your car. It's a simple but powerful indication of a stock's potential that can be used really to, to take the temperature of the market as well as for stock selection. And what really drove me here is that when I dug in to the model, it's a 20 factor model. It's a tested summary of a stock's potential. When I drill down on these factors, the financials, the earnings, the technicals, and the experts, I realize that these are the exact factors that my clients, guys at the biggest hedge funds and mutual funds in the world, were looking at and trying to get a read on every day as they were analyzing their stocks. And Mark built all this into a model and rolled it up into this power gauge rating that tells you very quickly, very concisely about a stock's potential to either outperform or underperform the market over the next you know, six months or so. And what really, really intrigued me as well um, is the fact that the model is 85% fundamental. And that, that struck me, right? Because Mark is known as a technician. I'm a CMT. I'm also an MBA too, right? So as I said, I do care about the fundamentals. And the fact that the model was 85% fundamental really got me engaged. And when I was digging in, I was like, you know, the financial side, this is what your value investors, your Warren Buffetts of the world look at, right? Debt to equity, valuation, return on equity and cash flow. And then your growth investors, well, they, they're looking down here. They're looking at earnings and as in particular, you know, are earnings growing? And if so, how fast? Are companies surprising to the upside or the downside and what's the trend in earnings are they are they is it accelerating is it declining you know some valuation work but more importantly how consistent are the earnings then we layer in a little bit of technicals and our secret sauce and really what i spent a lot of time talking to institutional investors about 
was what we call experts, but it's really sentiment, right? My clients wanted to know what my analysts were doing with their earnings estimates. Hey, is your analyst lowering uh, his or her estimate on Apple? And hey, your other clients, are they short this stock? You know, what, what is, what, what's your gauge on short interest? And you know, this is the secret sauce to our model that you're not going to see anywhere else and really drives a lot of the trading that professional investors do. So when I saw this, I got really intrigued. Again, I joined Shaken Analytics back in March of last year, and it really was Mark in this model that got me excited because the Shaken Power Gauge cuts through the clutter. I saw how much work Wall Street analysts and hedge fund analysts do to come up with their thoughts and, and conviction levels on a stock, and Mark's model, the Shaken Power Gauge, does all that for you very simply, and you can see it very clearly, runs from very bullish to very bearish, clear, concise indication, done for you research about a stock's future potential. And one of my favorite investors of all time really says it best in terms of using models. This is a quote from, from Jim O'Shaughnessy. Uh, he runs a, a quantitative uh, investment firm up in Connecticut. Models beat human forecasters because they reliably and consistently apply the same criteria time after time as opposed to human beings who are swayed by, here's that word again, emotions and opinions. And, and Jim is amazing. Jim's actually on Twitter and he shares his thoughts and ideas. Anybody who's on social media, I would implore you to follow Jim O'Shaughnessy and any of you who have actually gone to our website and seen our blog. I recently wrote a blog post highlighting uh, some of Jim's thoughts and ideas. I, I admire Jim immensely. I'm actually rereading one of his books right now. He's written four. But here are the results for the Cheek and Power Gauge and why models are so powerful. Uh, if you look at the results, this is from 1999 until the end of 2017. Our very bullish stocks have returned 20% per year. And our bullish stocks have returned 12.5% per year. And that... Above the benchmark. Yeah. That's relative to you know 6% for the Russell 3000 uh, on a cap-weighted basis and 9% on an equally weighted basis, but just as importantly, as important as it is to know what stocks you should be looking at to buy, i.e. the very bullish and the bullish stocks, when the environment turns and when the trend changes, you really need to know what stocks to avoid. And our bearish and very bearish stocks drastically underperform the market and kind of sidestepping those landmines that can blow up your portfolios. And I've already seen questions coming in the Q&A window about Apple. We're going to get to that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Sidestepping those landmines make all the difference in the long term because just as important as what you own, it's what you don't own that can really impact your performance. And the model has just had tremendous success over 18 years uh, of testing. So what we're going to walk through today are my keys to a repeatable stock selection process in the new year because you know things are different now. What we're going to talk about is how you can identify the strongest and weakest areas of the market. And we want to buy bullish stocks when they are oversold. We want to avoid bearish stocks or take advantage of the downside by buying put options uh, when those stocks become overbought. We have proprietary signals that can be used to enhance your performance. And really importantly now, because the trend is now down for the market, knowing when to play defense. That's what we're going to walk through today. So my top-down process starts with an overview of the market. And I think we would agree uh, the charts that we looked at earlier uh, in conjunction with your views is the market is bearish or cautious, right? So with that as a starting point, what we can start to do is look at the different areas of the market that are more bullish than the market overall or, and more bearish than the market overall. And again, that's all driven by the check and power gauge, right? When we look at this sectors of the S&P 500, we can very quickly and easily see which sectors of the market are stronger than the S&P 500. For instance, utilities has one bullish stock, 25 neutral stocks, and one bearish stocks. 
note that that's the most bullish sector of the market <laughs> right now. I mean, it's, it's crazy, but that's the environment that we're in. This really tells you, you know, very quickly when you log into Cheek and Analytics, when you become a member, you can look at two screens and basically get the temperature of the market by looking yeah. at these ratios for the sectors as well as the, uh, the subsectors. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is an intensely defensive market right now. And, you know, that's, that strategy right now is what's winning. Um, yeah, defensive, and, and we'll talk about that because we, in our morning notes, uh, started advocating and advising our members to turn defensive uh, back in the mid-October timeframe. And, and those investors who, who heeded that advice have outperformed throughout the end of the year. But, I mean, just look, there are tells you quickly, there are one, two, three, four, five sectors of the market that don't have any bullish stocks. So that tells you right away what kind of market environment we're in. But if you want to take the analysis a step further and look at the different industry groups, you can see that most uh, have bearish skew to them, right? Uh, only, only the insurance industry group is, is neutral with three bulls and three bears. Everything else has more bullish stocks than bearish stocks. So again, Everything being driven by that shaken power gauge. But when the market finally does stabilize, and it will stabilize at some point and begin to move higher, you need to know what stocks you want to buy. And our process is simple. We look for what we call shaken classic bulls. And at the end of the day, a shaken classic bull is a stock that has a bullish shaken power gauge rating, is outperforming the market, and has bullish or strong cheek and money flow. An example of that, and this chart, this chart is dated, it's for illustrative purposes only, uh, was really those Centene through much of 2018, late 17 and 2018, you can see it's a very bullish stock. We read our charts from the bottom up. So the ribbon here tells us what the power gauge rating is and has been. And you can see it's been bullish or very bullish from April. And around that time, the stock started to outperform the market. Again, that's our secret sauce. Relative strength is really important. I used to cover mutual funds. They are measured by how they do relative to the market. So they are always going to try to skew their long ideas to names that are outperforming. So that's why we use it as part of our process. So bullish and very bullish stocks that are outperforming the market with strong money flow are the types of names that we want to own. And the flip side and what we're really paying a lot of attention to now are the names to avoid or the names on which we want to buy put options or try to take advantage to the downside are the shaking classic bears. And it's just the flip side of the classic bull. Power gauge rating is bearish. It's underperforming the market or its relative performance is weak. And shaking money flow is weak. And, you know, an example of that is literally a household name. My guess is 90% of the people on this call, have their products in your home. It's Whirlpool Corporation. But just because you have their products in your home and they make good products doesn't mean the stock is necessarily a good stock. And when I talk to investors and I use this as an example of my process, I, I mean, what I like to say is this is an angry looking chart. Look at all of this red, right? Bearish stock, underperforming the market. And the institutional investors, my former clients, selling the stock the entire way down, right? These are the types of names we want to avoid. And when the opportunities present themselves, look to take advantage of this downtrend uh, for those who, who trade to the bearish side. And really what drives a lot of what we do and what we're looking for is what we like to call the dynamic duo. It's the shake and power gauge rating plus relative strength because it does help us find the really big winners and the really big losers. Because as I said, Superior returns come from stocks that outperform the market. Mutual fund managers, think of the big guys like Fidelity and Wellington and T. Rowe Price, the household names that you've heard of uh, over the years. They are measured by how they perform relative to the market. So if they own a stock that's up 10%, you might think that's great. But if the market's up 20%, they actually didn't do a very good job. And at the same time, if they own a stock that's down 5% while the market's down 10%, well, then they did a great job. That's why we look at relative strength. And we'll often say that relative strength stands alone as a bullish or bearish indicator 
because the big investors who move markets, they're measured based on relative performance. So we want to focus our buy ideas on names that are outperforming the market. And interesting now, as the market is selling off, we're encouraging our members to start to build lists because the stocks that held up the best as the market sold off are likely to lead when the market bottoms. And that's a key point. If you take nothing else away from this presentation tonight, relative strength stands alone as a bullish or bearish indicator. And the stocks that outperformed as the market was going down are the most likely to be the leaders when the market does bottom. And once we figured it out- I was just gonna add, you know, if you think about it, it's sort of, it, the power gauge tells you it's a great or a good fundamental stock. The relative strength says it's got momentum in its favor. So you're really taking two of the primary disciplines and in investing and putting them both on your side. Exactly right. I like to think about it. I like to think of it as the power gauge in conjunction with relative strength tells you what to buy. And then here you can see we have our proprietary, not going to find them anywhere else, signals tell you when to buy and when to sell, right? So once you've identified your, your bullish stock that's outperforming the market, that's great. But what most people struggle with is timing. Anybody can tell you, you know, this is a good looking stock. Most people can't tell you when to get involved. We can because we have these proprietary signals. Same thing on the sell side. Right, it's easy to see a stock is, hey, this stock is going down, but when is the most opportune time to sell it? Well, when one of our sell signals triggers, right? So we add our buy and sell signals. So as you're walking through your process and you're building your list of stocks, we're going to give you daily email alerts. So once you've built your list of bullish or bearish stocks that you're considering, right, we don't expect you to kind of log in, be able to log in every day. We understand you're busy. We do the work for you. We'll send you an email in the morning to tell you, hey, one of the stocks on your list triggered a buy signal today. You might want to take action. And this was an email alert. I had a list that I was keeping track of because in the summer, software stocks were all the rage. I had a list of software stocks that I wanted to be alerted when they triggered one of these signals. One of those was Citrix. So back on June 26th, I get an email in my inbox. Hey, Citrix triggered an oversold buy signal today. So Dan, you might want to take a look at that. Well, I did actually. I looked at it and it checked all the boxes for me to make it my bullish stock of the day in my note. Every day in my note, every trading day, I will give you an idea, either a bullish or bearish idea. And this is part of how I come up with those ideas. The signal triggered when the stock was around $104 made it my bullish stock of the day on its way to $115. Done for you research tells you when to take action on the right stocks at the right time. But now again, the market dynamic has changed. So what we want to look at is how to minimize your exposure to the dangers and risks that are prevalent out there as the market trend has turned from, from bullish to, uh, to bearish. And it all starts with my top-down process, right? We've looked at the market. We've looked at the industry groups. We've combined relative strength with shake and money flow and added in the signals to tell us what to, when to get involved. So now we're going to walk through kind of what that looks like on, a, on you know, an entire trade basis. You know, last year in, uh, in, 2000, in November of 2017, I was invited onto Bloomberg TV. It was the day before Thanksgiving. And the reporter, you know, said she wanted to talk about retail stocks going into the holiday shopping season. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. Retail stocks were really beaten down at the time. And I had, a, I had a view on retail stocks based on some of the work that I had done. So we came in and talked about it. And I actually said, what I said at the time was, everybody is short retail stocks and long Amazon, uh, figuring Amazon is going to put all the retailers out of business. And, and these retailers were trading like they were going to go out of business. And I just said, hey, I think that's a little overdone. I think we want to look at retail to the long side. An interesting thing happened. About two weeks later, retail began outperforming the market. And it really outperformed through much of 2018 until we got to the fall. And you can see that here, right? Here's the XRT. 
outperforming the market, nice steady uptrend. Here's your money flow. Institutional investors were buying the retailers and then it rolled over. So while, while retail was outperforming, we were recommending retail stocks until the party ended, until it started to roll over, until retail began to underperform, at which point the tools were there to get us out of those trades. So here's a great example of that. Here's Ross Stores, name you've probably all heard of. Throughout most of last year was a bullish stock outperforming the market. Bullish money flow throughout most of the back half of last year and a nice just steady uptrend. You, know, you could have bought this stock at any point in here as the stock, you know, nice on, on some of these pullbacks to a rising trend line, right? But something interesting began to happen. As retail started to roll over, so did Ross stores, but you might not have seen it. What I'm going to show you now is a sell signal that most traders don't see. We call it the chicken bearish money flow sell alert because what happens is as Ross stores was in that nice steady uptrend, it was trading at new 52 week highs, but look at money flow. Institutional investors were selling the stock into strength. A lot of these big institutions try to hide what they're doing. The check in money flow indicator allows us to see what the big institutional investors were doing. So if you, you know, had been long Ross stores and, and using check in analytics, what you would have seen was check in money flow was turning bearish as the stock was making new highs. And then the stock began to underperform the market. And that was your signal to get out. And you could have had the opportunity to get out of the stock in the night, you know, between 95 and a hundred dollars on its way down to the, to the $75 level, really kind of saved yourself a lot of pain to the, to the downside, similar dynamic at play here in Macy's, right? Again, we caught Macy's at around $28 bullish stock of the day on its way to 40. But as the stock was making 52 week highs, institutional investors were selling stock began to underperform the market. So not only do we help you get into the stocks, but we give you the tools to get you out of the trade and avoid a big drawdown. How great would it be? What would have been worth your portfolio to get out of Macy's at $38 instead of riding it down to $28? Another big theme that we were playing through most of 2018 was software. Uh, Famed venture capitalist Mark Andreessen, famous for saying software is taking over the world. Another uh, popular investor, widely followed, uh, Howard Lindzen, who, who started uh, Stock Charts, actually somebody, uh, somebody who I know. He actually, Howard coined the phrase, software is eating the world. And I was, I was honored recently, Howard, uh, on Stock Twits, called me a, uh, called me a must follow. So that was, that was nice coming from him. But software, you can see it here has been in, was in a nice steady uptrend throughout most of 2018 and during that time was really outperforming the market. But look what happened. Underperformed the market as institutions started selling. So there were opportunities to play both sides, to be long the stocks, to take advantage to the upside and then get out of the way. And really, you know, Adobe is a great example of this. Here's Adobe outperforming the market throughout most of 2018 and all along the way throughout this uptrend, these arrows are those proprietary signals that you're not going to see anywhere else that could have given you opportunities to get into this stock and ride the wave throughout this uptrend. But look what happened here as the stock was, you know, trading near 52 week highs around the $270, $280 level. Institutions started selling the stock. Check in money flow turned bearish. Shortly thereafter, the stock began to underperform the market. So had you been following along with our process, you had a nice opportunity to ride the trade to the upside and no one's promising you that you're going to get out of the top. As a matter of fact, more often than not, you're not going to get out of the top, but there's no reason you couldn't have gotten out of this stock at around $250 before it traded down to $200. Again, think about what avoiding those landmines does for your portfolio in the long term. It's, it's reasons why you know Ken can look at us and say, hey, I turned my account from $235,000 to 
to $1.2 million in seven months, just kind of following along. I would not have been able to achieve this without your system. So now I just want to ask a quick question. You can type it into the uh, Q&A Q &A window. Would you buy this stock based on everything that we've talked about so far? Relative performance, rating, money flow. Would you buy this stock? And I'll wait for some of those answers to come in. Josh, I don't know if you're seeing some of them. I'm seeing a lot of them, and they are all no's. They're all no's, which yes. is great. <laughs> People have been listening. People have been listening, which is great. But here's, here's what's always interesting to me. When I reveal the name, does it change your mind? Here's a name we all know. We probably use the product. I use the product. I actually don't watch TV. I don't even have a regular cable subscription. I, I, you know, I have Netflix. Doesn't mean it's a good stock, but it's one I get asked about constantly. This is what I'm talking about when we say models help you take your emotions out of the equation. What Jim O'Shaughnessy was talking about, why he prefers models, because it's easy to get caught up in a name, a name you know, a name you use every day and think that must be a great stock. Well, here's Netflix. Bearish rating since July begins underperforming the market in August, and the institutional investors start selling their stock around the August time frame. Yet not one but two shots based on our signals to get out of the stock between you know 360 and 380 dollars on its way to 260. Think about what avoiding these landmines, especially in a bear market can do for you. So one of the things that we can help you do is actually screen for personality changes. And what we mean by a personality change is when the stock goes from outperforming the market to underperforming the market, that's when we know we want to get out of the way. And our screening tool can help you identify stocks that have had that personality change. And I said we would get to it. Here it is. It's circled. The one that everybody, the, you know, the one that everybody's talking about is Apple. And here's Apple. Nice steady uptrend throughout most of 2018, right? Trillion dollar company and off to the races, outperforming the market through most of that time. But look what happened. As the stock was making 52 week highs around $230, look who was selling. The institutional investors were selling. That was your first signal that something wasn't right. My former clients, the big guys who move markets, were using this strength to get out of the stock. Shortly after that, in late October, our rating went bearish on Apple. I was with the stock at around $210. And then a couple of weeks later, Apple began to underperform the market with the stock at around $200. So, like I said, I'm not saying you're going to catch the top every time, but the tools were there to get you out of Apple at 200 or $210 in that range. Apple traded down to the low 140s today. Could have sidestepped a 60-point drop, a 30-plus percent drop in Apple using Chaikin Analytics. And here's another one. I get asked about it constantly, NVIDIA, same type situation. As the stock was making 52 week highs, the power gauge rating turned bearish at around $260. At around $240, Goldman Sachs made it a conviction buy before the stock promptly fell out of bed. Goldman's mea culpa was down here somewhere. They actually did. I give them credit. They came out and said, hey, we were wrong, but that was 100 points later. But with the stock at 52-week highs, the institutions were selling. The stock started to underperform the market. You had your chances to get out of NVIDIA you know, and avoid. And, yeah. And Dan, a lot of people ask, okay, so I didn't get out of NVIDIA. I still own it. What do I do now? We get asked that about NVIDIA. We get it asked about, about Apple. I say just evaluate it as is, right? And again, your time frame matters. Um, but what I like to do is I like to ask myself, 
would I buy, would I buy this stock today? Right? And the answer is no. You have a, a bearish stock underperforming the market, being sold by institutional investors in a clear downtrend. There's an opportunity cost to holding these. Now, again, your time frame matters. And you know, whether you're a trader or investor, you have to kind of answer that question. But if you're a trader, there's no reason to be long these stocks. Yeah, the right? market does not care what you bought the stock for. They don't care. No, they don't care where you got in. They don't care where <laughs> your pain point is. And you have to evaluate it. I remember reading, you know, uh, I've obviously follow a lot of great traders and reading an interview on Paul Tudor Jones and, you know, a young guy coming into the desk and seeing that he was long a stock and, and, and asking Paul Tudor Jones, where are you long? And, and Paul Tudor Jones looked at him and said, it doesn't matter where I'm long. I'm long last night's close and I need to evaluate what I'm going to do with the stock now. And that's how I like to think about it. Use the tools that we have to evaluate where the stock is now to make the right decision because, you know, there is an opportunity cost to continuing to hold on. Because when the market does bottom, the names that are likely to lead us out don't look like this. They're not underperforming on the way down. We want these mounds of green. We want the stocks that are outperforming on the way down those are the names we want to focus on when the market bottoms because those are likely the leaders coming out. So again, as I said, somewhere around October when the market broke down, we switched to a defensive posture uh, just based on a lot of the work that we were doing within the data we have in Cheek and Analytics, my experience as a, as a technician, we switched to a defensive posture. And what's interesting is even in a defensive posture, there are still opportunities to make money both on the long side and the bearish side. But the first part of being in a defensive posture is knowing what to avoid. Uh, one of the areas of the market that we've been really bearish on, telling people to avoid or take advantage of opportunities to the downside has been leisure and entertainment. PEJ is the leisure and entertainment ETF. And you can see clearly breaking down. It's been underperforming the market since July. Institutional investors were big sellers. So this to me was great hunting ground for bearish ideas. And one of them was Win. Win at $148 was a very bearish stock. It was underperforming the market with bearish money flow. I checked in with our options play tool for an idea for a bearish vertical put spread. Highlighted it when we got one of our signals. This one, an overbought sell signal. And that options trade idea returned 158% over the next month. So, you know, that's the top down approach. Weak market, weak industry group, weak stock. That's your opportunity. Same thing, Domino's Pizza, right? Domino's Pizza, we identified it. Look what was happening here. Domino's was trading up, near, up here near 52 week highs, but look who was selling. My former clients, Cheek and Money Flow was bearish. Domino's began to underperform the market. I identified it as a bearish idea for our clients, suggested a bearish put spread that returned 100% over the next five days because they came out and their earnings missed expectations and the stock gap lower gave us an opportunity to close the options trade at 100% profit. Just because the market has rolled over and is going down does not mean you can't take advantage of it and actually profit. If you have the right tools, you can certainly do that. Healthcare equipment, another one, was a shining star throughout most of 2018 until it began to lag. Once it started to lag the market, this is XHE, the healthcare equipment ETF. I started identifying bearish names, one of which was Quidel, Q-D-E-L. We had it here at about $62 as a bearish idea. You can see why. Bearish rating, underperforming the market, weak money flow. About a week later, they had an unfavorable court ruling that took the stock down 20% in a day. Our options trade that we opened on November 21st returned 117% when we closed it. But again, there are still opportunities to make money on the long side, even when the market's going lower. You just have to apply the right approach. You have to look for what we call the ideal setup. Warren Buffett calls it the fat pitch. He's famous for saying they don't call balls and strikes on Wall Street. You don't have to swing at everything. You can wait for your pitch. Whether you call it a fat pitch, I have buddies who work at Fidelity. They actually call it the Fidelity fat pitch. We call it the ideal setup. We look for leading parts of the market. What's leading right now? The defensive parts of the market. One of the defensive parts of the market is consumer stables. Here's XLP. Nice uptrend. 
began outperforming the market in October when the market rolled over. We identified Helen of Troy, a soaps and cosmetics company, when it was around $114, on its way to $140 as the market was going down in a straight line. There are opportunities out there. You just have to follow the process, and we have all the tools. I identified this stock as my bullish stock of the day. As the market was turning lower, stock went from $114 to $140, another part of the market Again, not exciting, right? I'd much rather talk about Apple and NVIDIA and Netflix, but- Utilities, utilities are the place. Utilities are leading. They're the place. And you know what's exciting to me? Outperforming the market. And that's what's happening here. Utilities, again, started to outperform the market in October. Nice steady uptrend for the XLU. Take a look at a name that I think is in play right now, Duke Energy. This chart is as of today. Duke is a bullish stock with a strong trend in a strong industry. It's outperforming the market with a bullish rating. So that dynamic duo is here. It's in gear. Stock is oversold with bullish money flow as it pulls back to test support. I like Duke Energy, D-U-K. If you're taking notes, this is an idea. This is an actionable idea right now, D-U-K, in a leading part of the market. We have a leading stock in a leading part of the market. So even as the market's going down, there are going to be opportunities to the long side if you know how to find them. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick, who's actually uncovered some, some good opportunities in the insurance space. Well, again, uh, a less than exciting industry, one of those sort of defensive industries. You can see it's actually one of the very, very few industries that has more bullish stocks than bearish stocks. So it actually is an industry where there might be some opportunities. And it didn't take long actually drilling down to find those fat pitches. But again, not a lot of opportunities, right? Not a lot of no, you know, no, no. And bears, but here's, <laughs> here's a good one with an insurance a name. We right. all know actually. Yeah. Genworth. It's a solid name. We've all heard it. Uh, you can see when the market has been tanking, Genworth has actually uh, held up very, very nicely. It's got great relative strength, got great fundamentals. You can take a look at the, one of the things Dan hasn't been showing, but you can drill into the power gauge rating and look at the underlying factors to see, you know, do the underlying factors all add up as well. And across the board, uh, Genworth has really good factors, both the financials, the earnings, and the experts all are, you know, at the highest level. Remember so really what I said, like, you know, again, this is what we're looking for. As yeah, the, the market goes down, the names that are outperforming, right here, outperforming, right. these are the names that are likely to lead you out. So you have a very bullish stock that's outperforming the market. And look at it. Right. This stock, this is, how many stocks are trading near their 52-week highs? We can help you find them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think about it like this. Chicken likes it. The market, which is signified by relative strength, likes it. And then institutions are beginning to get into it and they're beginning to like it. So that's the kind of groundswell that actually bodes well for a stock. So that it's an interesting one. So definitely you know, it, I've, I've actually been highlighting insurance names in my, in my notes, my morning notes to, to chicken analytics members. And when you become a member, you'll get my note every, every trading morning with an idea in it. And you know, my, a, a few of my long ideas recently have been coming from the insurance uh, industry group. Yeah, and it's a budget stock play. You know, you can get into it for 450 or 470. So it's true. Uh, a lot of opportunity <laughs> there. All right. Go to the next slide there. So that's Shaken Analytics. It's uh it's an award winning platform. It won the 2017 Benzinga Global FinTech Award for Best Trading Idea Platform. And you know, one of the features that got us this award was the discovery tool. And it's funny that we're using Netflix as the example, right? We looked at Netflix before. We said, hey, this is a stock you don't want to own. Well, just like Netflix looks at your viewing habits and says, hey, you like this movie, maybe you might like that movie. We have a discovery tool that says, hey, you don't want to own Netflix, and here are five other stocks that are similar to Netflix that you don't want to own as well. Roku, CBS, names you've heard of, Liberty, Sirius, and Cable One. But if you are looking for an idea in that space, Maybe you want to consider Graham Holdings or Deckers, right? So you can plug in one ticker symbol and get similar ideas 
as well as swap ideas, right? So if a name is bearish and you own it, maybe you want to swap out of Netflix and into yeah. Graham Holdings, GHC. You know, this is a great tool right now because there aren't that many great opportunities in the market. So when you find a good one like Genworth and then <laughs> put that into the discovery engine, you'd be amazed at the other four or five stocks that come out. It gives you some ideas to work with. Whereas trying to ferret them out on your own is really hard work. The discovery engine sort of takes a good idea and then broadens it out to five or six great ideas. Yeah. And again, it, it helps you identify, look, if you're going to swap out of one, here's one you should think about. I mean, look at Graham Holdings here. Remember what I said? Yeah. Outperforming the market. Bull, very bullish rating, outperforming the market. It's oversold. Money flow, it's coming a little bit, but you know, it's been predominantly strong for the past couple of months. Stock is in a nice uptrend above a long-term trend line. If I owned Netflix, I would think about getting out of it and swapping into Graham. So hopefully what you've seen to, tonight is, and, and we tried to make it educational in a lot of different ways, how to avoid stocks, but also how to pick out the right stocks. At the heart of it, you've got Chicken Analytics, which you know, over the years has become a proven stock selection system. It just works. Um, and it's a system that, again, if you think about making these trades or getting out of these trades, more importantly, and the money it saves you right now, it's, it's the, it, it lists for twenty one ninety five a year. Um, and that comes with everything that you saw, all the charts, all the screening, all the ability to drill down into the fundamentals um, and the discovery engine, which uh, Dan just talked about, all included, along with a lot of other features. Um, but one of the things we're going to do is uh, we just got out of our, uh, you know, end of year Christmas. And our, typically when we're on a webinar, we offer uh, Chicken Analytics for $17.95. I'm going to see if we can do a little bit better. Um, you know, again, some of the other things that come out of this, uh, Dan showed you the screener. Uh, we also have this options utility that basically once you find the underlying stock and going in the right direction, you can use this tool to find absolutely the best options trades, either simplistic calls or puts, or more importantly, some of the vertical put spreads or call spreads um, that might have more juice to it. 158% in win with limited risk. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it's got daily price updates that you don't pay any exchange fees for. It updates you by the minute when there's an earnings release. Um, and then, you know, on a daily basis, you get Dan's Morning Insights. And then on a weekly basis, you get Mark's uh, Market Insights. So there's a lot to this. It's not just one system. And, and the thing that I'm most proud of is that our members absolutely get just white glove treatment. Uh, we have multiple weekly strategy sessions. Um, the one that is listed here is the one that Dan hosts on uh, uh, Monday night, which is great. Um, but there's also option strategy sessions. There's pre-markets on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, there's just a lot of uh, hand-holding. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do all these coaching sessions. And then if you still want some really specific ideas, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching with you. So, all of that's included in the membership. So I was successful. I argued for you guys and I said, look, let's, you know, why kill the year end special the day before our webinar? That doesn't seem fair. So I got the $15.99 um, to uh, keep going. And if you can sign up by midnight, that would be very helpful. Um, and one of the things I'd like to encourage is call that number. There's, there's people there. We've got consultants. If you've got additional questions about what Chicken Analytics can do for you, they're there. They can answer your questions. Um, they're very well steeped in, in Chicken Analytics knowledge. So take advantage of that phone number. Give them a call.
Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, taking the time out. I know the market's been a little bit crazy, but uh, uh, I just want to thank you all for, uh, for joining us, and I'm going to kick it back over to Josh. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, to take advantage of Nick and Dan's offer, I've put out a link into the chat box. You can click on the link directly, and it will automatically apply the excellent discount that Nick is holding for everybody for the new year. You will immediately have access to Dan's morning note. You'll get it tomorrow morning. You'll get uh, marks this weekend. You have, you'll be able to see all of our weekly sessions, which includes, as uh, Nick mentioned, Monday strategy call with Dan Russo every Monday, along with all the archives to that. So you can go back and see what we talked about last Monday uh, and going forward. And of course, access to our client success team one-on-ones and everything else. So to take advantage of Dan and Nick's offer, you can use the link that I put into the chat window, www.chakenanalytics.com slash kickoff. And you can always call us at 877-697-6783. My colleagues are available right now to take your call. Again, that's 877-697-6783. Thank you, everybody, and have a great night.